Today we're going to be talking about how me and Joe both were raised by single mothers and um, myself personally, you know, my, my mother battled depression her entire life. And, you know, depression is for a lot of people, it's, it's genetic, you know, it, it's, it's in your bloodline. And for me, unfortunately it was too. So, you know, seeing, you know, depression cripple my mom as, you know, a young kid up until, you know, my, through my teenage years and up until my, you know, my adult years and all the way up until her passing, um, you know, it really shed light on the struggle and how difficult that actually was. And once I was old enough and I dealt with these things myself, it was, it was, Actually, you know, it, it made it a bit easier for me to get through these things and have a better understanding of what my mom was actually going through when I used to get so frustrated with her at a younger age, you know, and um, depression is real, man. It's it's so real and it's so crippling sometimes. And, you know, you don't really get it when you're young because you don't understand necessarily what you're going through. You just think it's some kind of just phase or maybe it's your diet or what you're doing and you try to change things and you don't realize it's something that you really can't control. You know, you can help it, but you can't control it, you know, but, um, yet, uh, in light of today, today's my mom's birthday. She would have been 70 years old, you know? So I felt like that this would be a good time to actually speak about this. Cause she's on my mind. She's on my heart right now. You know, I miss her dearly, you know? And, it sucks because, you know, I lost her to cancer, you know, and I saw, you know, I saw so many years go by where she, you know, she allowed depression to, you know, keep her in this shell. You know, she had depression, severe anxiety, and she she spent majority of her life in her home, never leaving never leaving. And the only time that I would ever see my mom is if I went over there to visit her, which was tough because I was so busy myself, you know, but made it even more difficult as a kid, as a teenager growing up, not understanding depression really well myself and not understanding the ins and outs of it. You know, I placed a lot of blame on her because of how held back that I felt because of her holding herself back you know, battling depression and stuff, you know, I, I felt like my childhood was, was very deprived and there was a lot of resentment there, you know, because of not being able to understand exactly how difficult that was. But now that I'm grown, now that I've went through some of the most crippling depression myself, I, I get that, you know, and now I hate the fact that I get that after she's gone, you know, and can we, I'm gonna cut you off right there. Uh, can we get a little bit of the backstory on like how like you were raised, which we said last episode, you was raised born raised in Nashville, yeah. born and raised. As far as growing up with your mom like that, um, as far as the backstory, how many siblings were you raised in the house with? And like in the was it like a big, Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so you was raised by basically you you had two older sisters, right? And then your mama. Yeah. So you was in a house with all yeah. women growing up. Right. Yeah. How was and that like dealing with all of that? Like all the women in your house, then your mom has the depression. Like how did that Well, it wasn't just it wasn't just my mom either that dealt with depression. I witnessed my my sisters deal with it too and I used to I used to look at them like, what is wrong with y'all? Like, they both hit this spurt in high school where they were excelling. I mean, they were doing great in school. And then, yeah, I don't know if it was like freshman or sophomore year that they really just started to struggle with their emotional state, their mentality, their outlook on life. And man, I kid you not, it was, it was, it was actually my, my oldest sister at first, she just stopped going to school. It became a big issue in our household, bro. Like 
she went from extremely excelling and doing great in school to where she was like a cheerleader and everything. And all of a sudden, just bro, like I would wake up and she would just still be asleep. And some days, like she would just leave her door locked, you know, and my mom would be very upset. Like, you need to get up. You're, you're, you're skipping school. You're going to get in trouble. She did it so bad to where she actually, truancy came after her and she had to go to juvenile because of it. And mm. I had no idea. I don't think my mom understood, but it was severe depression and anxiety that had been brought to the forefront while she was in high school. And I didn't understand it until I hit high school and started dealing with it myself. Now, my younger sister, it trickled down to her, the one that went to L.A. with us, Crystal. She started developing the same things. And, you know, jumping back to my oldest sister, it eventually led to her. She completely dropped out. She dropped out. Like, it got so severe with her, she dropped out. Now, she went back and got her diploma, but she had to take a whole different route. Depression got the best of her, and we didn't know how to handle it. Nobody did. But, you know, my youngest sister, she ended up following those same footsteps and dealing with the severe depression and anxiety. And she was going down that same path. I think, I don't know if truancy really got after her, but it wasn't until after my oldest sister moved out and lived with my grandfather that uh, Crystal actually ended up going back, kind of getting it on track. But the relationship between her and my mom and my mom's depression and her depression clashing, clashing while living together, it had become so tainted that all of a sudden I find myself alone. It was just me and my mom. And I was there with so they, all her depression. So your sisters wasn't getting like any type of like resources uh, for their... Not back then. Depression, no, or... depression wasn't really a thing, man. And I mean, e even if it was, we were so poor. I mean, we didn't know. There was no internet. There was no Google. I mean, I don't even know back then if we even had flip phones. We might have had a pager. <laughs> right. But, Dang, okay. you know, there was no resources. You know what I mean? It was, I don't know what you're dealing with, but you better get it straight real quick because, I mean, this ain't acceptable. And my thing is, is, you know, my mom was dealing with it the most. Then it trickled down to my oldest sister. It got the best of her at that time until she she actually turned it around, moved in with my grandfather. And the way that she got control of her depression is she turned her life over to God, started going to church. My grandfather did the same. They did that kind of together. And that transformed her life. And she became this beautiful person, beautiful woman, strong, independent woman. And she's that way to this day. And she has been my rock through a lot of the depressing states of my life, you know, because of it. But so go ahead. Now I'm just saying, so your older sister, she fought through it by going to church and moving in with your granddad. And yeah. then it left. She moved in with my grandfather and things were rough, bro. She was going down a rough path. And I, I don't know her story. I don't want to speak for her. But something happened to where God got her, God, God reached her and she totally turned her, her life over to God. And that was the best move she could have ever made because she became such a better person for it. And I mean, she struggled with a temper, bro. She was out here fighting dudes and stuff. I'm not even playing, man. I had an older sister, but it's like I had an older brother sometimes, like the way she would fight for us. And like take up for us and stuff, but so yeah, when she, she left, when she left, that was it left for you me and when she left, yeah, because I was close to her, so I was very close to her. So it left you and your youngest, your younger sister, at home with your mom temporarily. She yes. left, yeah, for about a couple of years. But like I said, you know, my depression, my depression didn't set in. I was kind of just a normal kid doing my own thing, playing outside, playing video games, but. You know, depression had really set in for my mom. And it had got to the point where so, she didn't want to go anywhere. She didn't want to do anything. And my younger sister, not not younger than me, but the youngest sister, she, you know, she had started developing her own depression and anxiety. 
and lost all motivation to go to school herself. Her personality and her depression was clashing with my mom's personality and anxiety, which eventually led to her. After a couple of years of my my oldest sister moving out, she moved in with my dad. Left me. Oh, there. okay. So, yeah. so you was left there at home with your mom. Yeah. Like, and everybody else had moved out. So it was just you and your mm-hmm. mom. Yeah. What and age was this? Know, like, oh man, what was I? I was probably like 11 or 12, I think. I don't know, man. It was so far ago. I, I really don't know. I, I would say about 11 or 12 because, you know, I so, was kind of doing my own thing. I was a little rebellious back then, man. So I, I was just kind of like, man, you know, rules kind of went out the window for me. I was gone a lot. I didn't want to deal with it. So growing up, though, you were looking up to your sisters. Like as oh, yeah. your mama was dealing with her. I looked up to my sisters more than I did my mom. And at that time, I didn't have a relationship with my dad at all. He lived in the same town as me, but he had a a different family. You know, he had a new family. They were flourishing. I seen him every once in a while, but to be real, you know, and I know this now. I mean, there was a little resentment towards my dad back then, but I didn't know the whole story. So I didn't jump all in to you know, feeling that way towards my dad. I mean, I was upset that I didn't have my dad in my life all all the time, but I didn't understand why. So I didn't let myself like grow to hate him for that because I didn't know the story. And I'm glad that I did because what I found out later and what I know now after, you know, me and my dad have a great relationship now. He's been an awesome, awesome role model and, and man in my life, a guy that I can truly say I look up to now. And you know, it, it wasn't until later where I actually got to talk to him, get to know him better, um, that I found out that it was my mom's depression and anxiety and insecurities and, and just all these things that she just couldn't get a grasp on that led to their divorce. And and ultimately, it, it kept my dad away. He made so many attempts to try to be in our life, to try to take us to do things, to try to come pick us up, to try to buy things for us. And my mom's anger, resentment, depression, anxiety would come to the forefront of the well-being of her children at that time. And she would let that force a wedge in between us being able to have a father. And it's unfortunate, but it's something that she really couldn't control, man. It was just so overwhelming for her. What did you think, like, see, what did you think, like, her, she never, like, talked about how she, where did it come from, her, like, depression or anxiety or, she never said that. No, because like, I don't, no, no, because I don't, I don't think that she really understood that she was depressed. I think that she felt justified in the way that she felt. I think that what she was dealing with, she had no resources, no information, because what's crazy is like, you know, their generation, you know, my mom would be 70 today. And when you go back to her generation, my mom got married at a young age, but she also dropped out of school before she got married. Her education stopped very early, you know, so her, you know, that, and that's, that's the same with a lot of my relatives, you know, a lot of my aunts, my uncles, you know, their education level wasn't it even if they finished high school it wasn't as as advanced and resourceful as ours is today you know and it's even more so for the younger generations right now i mean like i said back then i didn't even have google when i was dealing with what i was dealing with you know but my mom basically you know her jealousy her insecurities her depression her anxiety all of these just overwhelming emotions that she felt when she was dealing with you know her divorce and all of this stuff like that, you know, and she couldn't get a grasp on it because she had no idea what it was. She probably just chalked it up to grief and was like, it'll get better. But it never did. It snowballed and it got worse. And So did y'all go on like any vacations or y'all go to bowling alleys or did y'all yeah, go out? We'll, we'll see, like- and that's the thing, man. We had multiple opportunities as kids to, you know, do these things with my mom. We had an aunt, you know, her name was Aunt Ruby, and my aunt would constantly come and pick us up, take us to Opryland, take us to Gatlinburg, 
you know, do these things with us. You try to have fun with us. She took us to all the good movies. My dad tried to do these things, obviously not with my mom, but with us. But my mom's depression, and I, I, well, I wouldn't say depression. I would say anxiety prevented her from, from wanting to go do stuff, be around people, experience these things. It kept her. I got a little bit of that myself. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, the difference is, like, you know what I mean? You have discussed that. Like, for you personally, the good thing is, is you can you can type that into a computer, a search bar, and be like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, why do I feel like this? And it's going to tell you, you have anxiety. And then you can easily say, all right, well, what can I do to help myself regarding this? Mm-hmm. And it'll help you. It'll tell you. You can watch YouTube videos. My mom, you know, my mom leaned on TBN. You know what that is? But you know what? Yeah, that's the uh, that the Christian network. It was like the original, the OG Christian network. And, yeah. and then what's bad about that is a lot of those evangelistic, TV evangelistic pastors ended up later on coming to the light being fraudulent scam artists. Yeah. And my mom was so And I desperate. bet you... I'm well, sorry, but mom, I bet you back in the day, like... um like dealing with that type of stuff, I'm pretty sure that um, if she would have talked about it or or anything like that, people would have called her like crazy. Like just, oh, she crazy. She cool. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It yeah. probably, yeah. like and nowadays, you can talk about it. Like it's like normal now. Everybody is dealing with it because of the world we live in. But back then, it seemed like people didn't have uh, compassion for other people. You know, no. so well, I'm pretty well sure I would say there wasn't it. compassion. I just think there was a lack of understanding because like I look at myself today and when I'm dealing with something like emotionally or I'm stressed out, I don't hesitate. I pick up the phone and I talk to somebody about it. You know what I mean? One thing that I can honestly say as a kid, I never once ever saw my mom pick the phone up and talk about how she was feeling. Never once. I never saw her do that. She never talked to me about it. She never talked to me about how she felt. My sister, my sister to this day, my oldest sister, I call her all the time. I call her all the time to talk about my feelings and everything like that. Bro, I can't tell you the last time she called me to talk about how she felt because that's just how they were brought up. That's how they were raised. They hold that stuff in and they deal with it independently. And see, I feel like, you know, my, you know, my, my oldest sister, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, because I feel like I I wish that I could, I could have been there more for her because I know she's been through some things herself, you know, but like my mom, I, I, sometimes I wish, man, like my mom would just set me down, had a cup of coffee with me and said, son, I feel like crap and I don't know why. And I could be like, you know what, mom, I've been there. What's going on with you? You know, but she never did. She never did. She never did Mm -hmm. because I don't think that she thought it would help because she didn't understand it. But, you know, uh, you know, like I said, my oldest sister, she she didn't do that either. But she's always been very, very strong and independent. Now, my my youngest sister. We talk, you know, it's it's coming from both sides. She calls me too you know she's dealing with something like we've been talking here lately my sister is dealing with you know the the situation where her children are growing up what feels to be so quick and her oldest daughter my niece is about to go off into the navy she just got sworn in and my sister is emotionally distraught right now because she's like what next for me, like, what next? I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't know, because I'm not there yet. My sons are six and seven. My daughter's 12. You know what I mean? But it's like, um, you know, like, we talk about it. We talk about it. So that's a good positive thing for us. But that's something that my mom never had. Unfortunately, neither did my oldest sister. But, yeah. So, okay, they moved out when uh, both your sisters left the house. Um, and you still left at home around 11 years old and you grew up, your mother was in the house. Okay. So your mother, your mother stayed in the house. So she really, 
probably wasn't one of those parents that was outside keeping an eye on you, you know, and, you know, uh, watching you while you was probably out there. So basically what I'm saying is you probably made a lot of bad decisions while your mom was in the house. No, well, outside. Let me give credit to my mom because she tried her best, the best way she knew how, to keep close tabs on us. My cat is trying to open up my door right now. Link, stop. <laughs> Anyways. This so, is a live podcast, people. <laughs> yeah. No, no cuts. No cuts. Raw footage. No, nah, so you know, my yeah, raw. my mom tried, you know, her best to keep tabs on us kids and and make it to where we could we could, you know, like grow up appropriately and have decent rules and you know it what it is is we grew up in probably the worst part of town we came from east nashville before east nashville was east nashville today i'm not talking about no gulch i mean back then east nashville was rough it's a bad Uh part of town and we grew up very close to like projects, stuff like that, you know. And then we, you know, we think we get we're getting out of that to a better area. And where we go, Antioch, Antioch, Tennessee. Now, mind you, Antioch was it was actually pretty fine uh, when we got there, but it went downhill very fast. And. um you know, like outside of that, you know, growing up in Antioch was it was a tough, tough uh, ordeal because, I mean, it, Antioch was pretty much the hood. And I was surrounded by bad, bad kids that and to put it in more um, detail about Antioch, Antioch is probably it's outside of Nashville. Maybe about ten minutes uh going south of Nashville. Yeah. That's where Antioch is located. So it's still in Nashville, but it's like ten minutes on the other side going south. Yeah. And I mean there's different portions of Antioch too. And we did not live in the good part. We lived in lower Antioch. And um I used to call it like little LA for lower Antioch or whatever. But I mean, I can honestly say probably about I would say about 80% of the of the kids that I grew up with are either dead, in jail, or on drugs. No joke. Not no, no exaggeration. And it's I mean, when I look back, I mean, it's it's, you know, it's a positive thing to think that, you know, I came up with all of that around me and and came up, you know, I'm I'm alive. I'm not an addict, not an alcoholic. Um, I made some bad choices. Yeah. You know, I've had a couple of failed relationships, a failed marriage, you know, but for the most part, grown man, here standing, level head on my shoulders, not addicted to anything and, uh, you know, not in no trouble. I've never been to jail, you know. Well, let's go back. That's good right there. So growing like when you was a teenager, when you was a teenager, yeah, your mom was battling depression and your dad wasn't even around. No, and your sisters at this point was out, gone. Like we were talking about earlier, what did you go through? Like as far I know you were telling me you were doing some things out there. Uh, you know what I mean? You made some bad decisions or whatever, but it led you uh, down a path that eventually led you down there in Florida. Like, cause right. you went well, down there with team, right? Yeah. Well, I moved. Like, I moved how did that all, how did that all happen? Guess, like, how did you go from going to school up here and then all of a sudden you're down in Florida as a teenager with your, well, one of your sisters? Well, you know, like I said, I grew up with a, a pretty rough crowd. And, you know, as a white kid in the hood, I mean, you want to do – you want to do what you got to do to stay safe and fit in. 
I mean, that's that was my priority coming up. I know I didn't want to shell myself up in my house and just play video games. I wanted to have friends. I wanted to go outside and play. And in order to do that, you had to be smart about it at a young age or you was going to get beat up and take advantage of. And um, I got picked on. I got picked on. I had my fair share of bullies. But I learned, you know, to kind of actually getting good with those guys to kind of protect myself. And it got to the point where those bullies stopped picking on me and kind of like took me under their wing and uh treated me like a little brother and i played that little brother role pretty well just to keep myself you know undercover and when in it and the good thing about that was was when any type of like other person tried to roll up and you know come at me in the wrong way those guys started taking up for me so i had that to my advantage so i didn't really get into many altercations i had my fair share of fights but nothing real serious um, it wasn't until my teenage years that my mom's depression and anxiety took its worst toll on me that I could have ever imagined. And that's when depression got real for me. And I had my first real episode of undeniable depression and anxiety didn't kick in until later when I hit high school, but depression happened when I was in eighth grade. I had everything going for me. My number one goal was do as best as I possibly could um, educationally and academically and get out of Antioch. My goal, I wanted to live in California. I wanted to become a surfer. I wanted to surf. I wanted to live by the beach. I didn't I If I never seen another city in my life, like with gray buildings and just concrete everywhere. I, I, it would have been too soon. So, you know, I wanted, that was my goal. I wanted out. I wanted out of Tennessee. I wanted to live in Cali. I wanted to be a surfer. I never wanted to wear a shirt. All I wanted to wear was swim trunks and have a surfboard and that's it. And that was my, my genuine outlook. And I hit eighth grade and I had some real close friends that I was coming up with. And I would say popularity kind of got the best of us. Like that's important to you at that age. Well, most kids, you don't want to be like, like ignored or thought of as a weird kid or picked on. You want to fit in. It's very important to kids at that age. And me and my buddies, you know, over the summer, we were going into eighth grade and we made that kind of like a thing for us. Like we weren't going to be, like in that middle area, we was gonna we was gonna try to jump up, and we did. And I started chasing girls left and right. I went after the hottest girls in school, and I was successful some of the time. And I got them, and I think that boosted a little bit of popularity at that time. Um, but with that, I began to focus more on that instead of my academics. So my grades started slipping. And uh, I was focusing more on girls than I was on my grades. And because of that, I ultimately failed two classes. Barely, but I failed them. I had to go to summer school. I'm poor. Summer school costs money unless you get a fee waiver. All my mom had to do was go up there and sign a form. Bro, we lived like four bro- four blocks from my junior high school. I walked to school. We lived four blocks. My grandfather said that he would take my mom and me up there. My mom's depression and anxiety had her so glued to that house, she refused to go up there. And wow. I fell. I was held behind. Now... Not saying that's my mom's fault because I failed. It's my fault because I failed, you know, but I had a second opportunity that I wasn't able to take advantage of. My friend, my closest friend at the time, he failed as well. Worse than I did. His mom knew how close we were. We were like best friends at the time. She was willing to pay without the fee waiver. 
for me to go to summer school with her son so that we could stay in the same grade. All my mom had to do was go sign the form. She wouldn't do it. And that killed me, bro. Like, I went from did so you have any like? Did you have any resent, right, resentment towards her? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be real, I, you know, I look at the trajectory of my life then and the paths that I, that I had taken following that summer after I failed. And there's still a little bit, I'm still salty about that, even after my mom's gone. And do you think that kind of um, like made you unmotivated to like move on with the next like ninth, tenth, eleventh, like which I didn't school? want to. I had to, or I would get in trouble, but I did not want to. I did not want to be there. I hated that school. I loved my friends. They were all gone. And I was there with these young kids that I had nothing to do with, didn't want anything to do with. And the ones that fell back, fell back for a reason. And we didn't, uh, it was just, it was bad, bro. And the the people that I surrounded myself with were really, really into drugs. And that's when I started dabbling. Very first time after I failed and wasn't able to stay with my class, that's when I started smoking real heavy and popping pills and drinking. I was going to school high. I was going to school getting drunk while there. I was sneaking into the stall, smoking weed, smoking cigarettes. I got caught so many times, sent to detention, ex uh, not expelled, but suspended for having cigarettes on me, just all kinds of stuff. And I, I never done that prior to it. Never. It wasn't until after that that failed year and I had to repeat eighth grade and that led to me and my mom clashing badly and my main focus was I just I want out of here but I didn't see a route out at that point because the same way that my sisters had kind of hit that rough spot and, and stopped going to school when I finally got to ninth grade I was still doing all that stuff, but I had now uh, went from not only doing it, but because I couldn't work and make my own money and we were poor and my mom wouldn't work. She never worked a day in her life. I uh, I started selling it too. And I uh, started selling it frequently around Antioch. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until I, I ended up, I, at first I started selling, you know, mild stuff. And then I kind of, I dabbled in some heavy stuff. It wasn't until I got robbed at gunpoint twice where I'm like, I'm not doing that anymore. But I was selling at school. I was selling around my neighborhood, but I got robbed on my mom's porch with a gun to my head, bro. Like, it it got rough. But my youngest sister, Crystal, when it went to L.A. with us, that robbery is what led to me moving to Florida because I was. And how old were you when that happened? Uh, it happened when I was 16. I turned 17. Then I moved to Florida. But uh, at that time, I was I was actually working at Food Line across the street because I could walk to it. But it still was bogus money, and I wasn't going to school. They weren't offering me full-time hours because I was supposed to be in school, so I wasn't making much. I was blowing my money on video games and nonsense. I would literally go to the mall, to Hickory Hollow Mall before it was the Global Mall, I would go to Hickory Hollow Mall, blow my whole check on nice clothes because I never had that before. I will blow my whole check on nice clothes and some video games and only go to school to show off them clothes. If I ain't have no new clothes, I wasn't going. <laughs> it got bad, bro. It got bad. And, you know, like when I hit ninth grade, though, that's when anxiety really kicked in. And I guess it was something I had never felt my entire life. Like what you had explained to me before, where being around a lot of people just, you know, really affected you in a negative way and made you feel claustrophobic and stuff. That's how I would feel in class. And it was mainly like in third, when I got to like third period, 
I would have extreme anxiety, bro. And it would just set in intensely. And I would ask the teacher, I think I was in mass media at the time, ask her if I could go to, you know, the bathroom or something. She wouldn't let me ever. And I would be in there having a daggone panic attack, bro. Like, and I'm like, I can't do this. So I, I eventually stopped going to school unless I absolutely felt like going or wanted to show off some new shoes or something. But, uh, yeah, that robbery, though, what I was talking about, my sister found out about that. My mom told her in a conversation, and my sister called me behind my mom's back and was like, Keith, if you keep this up, you're going to die. Somebody's going to kill you. She's like, you're going to end up like one of your friends. Like, you need to leave. And in that conversation, we talked for an hour to maybe two hours, and we had planned it all out. Didn't even talk to my mom about it. My sister, who was recently married, uh, sent her husband to come pick me up. My mom was irate, but she didn't stop me. I was gone. That's how I got there. Mm. It's crazy. That's bro. wild. Yeah. That's crazy. That's wild. So you ended up in Florida after all of that stuff went down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you stay uh, like when you moved to Florida, were you and your mama, did y'all have a good relationship then? Like did y'all, no. were y'all like, so you didn't communicate with her or something like that? No, she was very upset with me for a long time when I moved and <clears throat> I was actually kind of okay with it, to be honest, because I had some resentment there. And it was kind of like, a, well, if you had done what you probably should have done and helped me, you know, get back on my feet where I needed to be, this wouldn't have been happening. It was a wrong way looking back, but that's genuinely how I felt as a 17-year-old kid, you know, not understanding depression and anxiety like that. Uh, and trying to navigate through that myself at an early age. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of, yeah, I was, I kind of felt justified in doing what I did, but, um, I don't regret leaving and moving to Florida because I feel like it did save me, but I do hate that it probably hurt my mom like crazy for me to leave like that abruptly and not even no preparation whatsoever. And well, I mean, she was left was alone at that point. Yeah, and it says alone. a lot. It says a lot about her resilience and her strength. You know, even though she was dealing with that and still kind of confided to her home, she did make some major improvements after I left. Like I there were times where I she was hanging out with my grandfather, she was going to the grocery store shopping. She was cheerful when I would call and talk to her later on. It Something something kind of woke her up, I guess. I don't know what it was, but it, it says a lot about how resilient and, and strong she was because she did battle through what probably was the hardest part. It was her last child leaving home while dealing with all the depression, anxiety on top of it. And she found a way to fight through that. And, you know, she she battled all the way up until cancer got the best of her. That's wild. Yeah. She crazy, she also man. well she also relied on uh she did have a negative uh outlet with smoking. She smoked yeah. her entire life. And growing up seeing her smoke and being around smoking, I smoked and relied on that myself when I was dealing with depression and anxiety. And I can honestly say, you know, I've done drugs. I've done every kind of pill you could imagine, hallucinogens. I've done, you know, smoking weed and cigarettes was the hardest thing I ever had to break. I could have, I, I dropped everything like it was no problem. Cigarettes, that right there, bro, that had a hold on me like no other. You know, how many times would I quit and go back and quit, yeah. go back? Man, it was, it was like a never ending cycle for me. Anytime some rough patch happened in my life, first thing I did is go to the gas station and get a pack. But yeah. I could Man, probably say yep. to this day, cigarette free for years. Yeah, it's been like what a decade. Yeah. 
in a minute. Your your story your story reminds me of you know sometimes in life we think that uh, we look at our parents like they supposed to be like they just perfect like you know they had us they supposed to be there and all that they supposed to be just the perfect people that you know because they they're our parents but then right. sometimes like as we as I got older and especially like this past year or so I've realized that they human just like us so they going through a bunch of stuff that we don't even know about you know and it's crazy like how they can hold this stuff in i think that kind of affected me and my mama too like they can hold this stuff in and and i think as we get older we can really see like the effects of it of them but like man i wish like Speaking of like for you, it's like for you. Let's 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 touch on that. Like you also grew up with a single mother. How yeah. how many siblings did you have in your house? I had one one little brother, five years Kendrick? apart. Was it Kendrick? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I got one Kendrick. one. Yeah, we grew up in the same house. Okay, with your mom. Did you did your mom ever deal with any kind of depression or anxiety or anything like that? I think I believe so. I I want to say because she was a smoker, she smoked a lot of weed, and she stayed in the in the bedroom as well. Did and she still she, do uh, that? I don't think Did so. She still smoke? She drank though. I yeah, think she. I think that. she drank. Yeah, you. She that. might smoke. I don't know, but uh. Well, yeah. no, I'm talking about more about like cigarettes. She don't smoke cigarettes, does oh. she? Oh, oh, she smokes cigarettes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we grew up single parent same thing and uh yeah. you know i think i think um a lot of our troubles and probably her depression too i don't know man because she had me when she was 15. so we kind of grew young. up together that's young my mom yeah. had her first child when she was right around that age i think she was like 15 or 16. uh not by my dad but by her first husband she had two daughters by her first husband and then she had my yeah, I was had when I think my mom was like thirty three, I think. Mm-hmm. My dad was like thirty when I was born. So, but so you yes. you had you know so she had you when she was fifteen years old, and do you do you think because she had you at such such a young age that you have a better relationship with her because of it, or do you think that being so close in age and becoming an adult so fast when she was pretty much a young adult herself that i mean being only 15 years older than you when you're an adult i mean well she's like you know 32 33 i'm gonna put it like this i believe as a parent like i believe her she had me at 15 and i was a accident and I think I believe when when you have kids that are accidents as a disconnect. That's just what I think. And then when you have kids that are planned, it's different. Right. I'm not saying it's yeah. like, like, like like that all the time, but when it, when you have a kid on accident, I think it's yeah. a di- disconnect with emotions right there. Right. And because it, it, it's like I came all of a sudden, and it was not nothing planned yeah so um i think it's different for mothers that actually like want kids and they plan them and then they have them because then they it's like a different nurturing thing that happens there that i see where these these mothers that actually want kids and then they have the kids they they more motherly than right like my mama my mama had me on accident so she didn't even know how to be a parent and then she didn't know what nurturing was probably because she wasn't nurtured by her mama you know what i mean right yeah and yeah, that that's tough that's tough yes yeah. so when we grew up we kind of grew up together and it was it wasn't no emotional we didn't have no emotional it was emotional right. absence right we didn't have any of that growing up and that's tough man because a kid needs that a kid needs that man i mean they looked at their parent yeah. and i mean your mom was a kid 
she was a kid mm -hmm. when she had you, bro. I think I look at like 15 year olds. My my nephew over the summer that was staying with me over the summer with my sons, mm -hmm. bro, he's like 15. Yeah. That's a kid. Imagine him yeah. having a child. That's a kid, bro. Yeah. I mean, you saw the, you know, the stuff, the, the, you know, I mean, that, that is a large, large task to have a child at 15 years old. So mm -hmm. I imagine that was a, a major transition in her life and having to grow up so quickly, bro, like at 15. I mean, that you're, yeah. a, you're a mother. That, I can't. She was can't, 15. Can't. She had me. She got married at, I think, 15 or 16. I think she was forced to get married because yeah. that's just back in the day, you know, you have to get married. This, you know. And then right. I think it's just, man, that was the beginning of our downfall, me and my mother. And that would be on another episode because um, I'm going to talk about the the emotional absence of a parent. Right. We was talking because about that's that just, before. yeah. Yeah. That was the beginning of it. You having a, you're a teen mom, then you're forced to get married, then you, then you you divorce, and then the father goes away, and then now you're forced to, I mean, I got res all respect to all the single mothers out there, especially raising uh, sons. You're but right. I mean, yeah. sometimes, man, I try to, I try to look at it like I'm older now, so I'm trying to, we still don't have a good relationship, but sometimes I try to take it as if I don't know what, I don't, I didn't live in her shoes and I didn't know what she's going through. Yeah. And we all go through something. We all been through something. Yeah. So we have a disconnect. We don't have a good relationship, but she been through something too. They're not perfect. Our parents are not perfect. No. And uh, no. growing up as a teen, we expect for these people, growing up as young adults, teens, to we expect for these people to be just perfect. And they not. They don't. We don't know what they've been through. Well, we look at them been... for guidance. I mean, you know, we expect them to be our rocks. Then we expect them to not have issues. We expect them to have all the answers. Exactly. Our problem, yes. and we become selfish because of that. We are like that's exactly what it ain't is. Ain't nobody worried about you. You need to worry about yeah. me. I'm your kid. But yeah. the thing is, we don't is care about your feelings. Exactly. And you know, I can look back and and see myself as a teenager and how I, how unsympathetic I was towards my mom mm -hmm. and what she was because I was like man get whatever you're dealing with straightened out because I'm dealing with this and I need your help but she couldn't help yeah. me because she couldn't get help yourself yeah exactly. and it's, it's wrong man and it's like I hope to God I don't deal with what my mom dealt with with me and being inconsiderate, you know, like I try to be open and honest with my sons about how I'm feeling. You know what I mean? I don't go in depth. I mean, obviously not old enough to comprehend, but if I'm sad, I let them know I'm sad. That way they can feel like, you know, I'm I'm willing to communicate my feelings with them and they're wide open to communicate in theirs with me. And I want to have that healthy relationship with them if they're feeling a certain way. And luckily it's starting to pan out pretty well because my oldest son, Nico, he's, you know, he's coming to me about being sad about things and telling me he's down in the dumps and he don't understand why. And I just pick him up and I squeeze the living crap out of the kid with a good old hug, <sighs> kiss him on the forehead, tell him you don't have to understand it. But it is, it's is—it's going to be all right. Daddy's right here with you. And he just smiles real big and it makes him feel better. But you know what? Yeah. Because my mom didn't understand that and didn't have that communication with me, I never got that. And my mom didn't yeah. feel that satisfaction of being able to actually help in that direction either. So You know, to this day, my mom and myself, we have a disconnect. Like, I can tell her my problems, but she won't tell me hers. I say, what's wrong? Oh, nothing's yeah. wrong. I mean, how you expect for us to have a good relationship and you can't open up to me like I'm opening up to you? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. Like, nothing's hear you. wrong. It's not It's not nothing wrong with me. It's not nothing. Come on now. Like, yeah. if it's something wrong with you, we need to talk about it. Right. And, you know, because 
I'm your son. I love you. You know, that's this is how it's supposed to be. And but I don't know, man. It's, I think it's probably why our relationship ain't that well because she she does hold back so much. And yeah. she don't want people to know. She don't want to open up. She don't want to do this. She don't want to do that. And then now she's drinking. I don't want to say she's an alcoholic, but I mean, she's drinking to suppress whatever she got going on. And um, right. And we all d- done that before, but yeah, it's crazy, man. Because you never know what I like. That's just saying everybody say you never know what somebody's going through. But it's, when you, the older we gotten, and you look back, and you be like, and I think about it all the time, like, what did my mama really go through? Like, what was yeah. her, like, what was her childhood like? We don't know. And, well, bro, for we don't me, know what I made start, them be. I didn't start finding these things out until I was. In my thirties, I mean, in some candid conversations that I had with my dad, bro, like living with my dad for that time being for, you know, uh, about a year and a half after my divorce, bro, I started finding some stuff out. I'm like, what? I had no idea. You know what I mean? And, And it's like, man, these things were never communicated to me. I had to formulate my own opinion based on no knowledge of the situation. I just thought what I thought, and I thought that was the truth, but it wasn't at all. And it's like, man, you don't find out these things until a later age, and you're like, oh, my God. And then you feel guilty because you clearly don't handle it properly because you don't know what they're really going through. And, you know, I, I didn't find out a lot of these things. And my sisters are still telling me these things. And I'm like, what? Like, just random kind. They're like, yeah, you didn't know that? I'm like, No. Oh, it, it's wild, man. It, it really is like, you know, because we and I think a lot of it is you get caught up so much in your own life, too. That maybe you do you do know something, but you forget. You know, there's been a lot of instances like that for me. I get I get so caught up in my life, work, being a father, you know, planning, you know, future things, just so many things that you, you let all that stuff go by the wayside. And. You know, when you do have time to settle down, you know, that thought might hit you or you might be in conversation where somebody says something and it's like, whoa, you know, and you don't know, you know, how really to process it. So it kind of hits you or whatever. But, um, yeah, man, you're right. You're 100 percent right about the fact that, like, you know, we're so busy at a young age being selfish and thinking about ourselves that we have no idea what they were going through back then. And the only way you understand is when you reach their age of around that time mm-hmm. frame. And you're like, if they are going through anything like what I'm going through now, like, I can't believe I was like that with them. I wish I knew, you know what I mean? Cause mm-hmm. like, bro, If my mom felt the way that I felt when I was going through my divorce, if she felt that way when she was going through her divorce. Exactly. And she was trying to be my mom and going through my issues and I was being inconsiderate Mm -hmm. and selfish the way that I was, bro. I'm like, Mm -hmm. wow. Man, I wish I had known. I wish she had just told me. You know, I wish I at least had the opportunity to understand, you know. But you don't, unfortunately. You don't. I bet you, man. I bet you relationships uh, with parents and their kids would be different if, um, if we just like if you open up, if you just open up, if parents like just just kept it real, and and you grow up like that, you know. Yeah. Well, I think they do do a better job these days because it's like what what we were saying earlier on. You know, there's there's many more options, much more opportunity for you to tap into these emotions, tap into these feelings. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. We're talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how many more, you know, podcasts or YouTube videos are out there, but I'm sure there's tons of resources regarding these types of things. Hopefully we can reach people. I'm going to tell you these things, you know. Exactly. And I'm going to tell you something right now that you're talking about, you things you didn't know about. My mama didn't tell me until later on. So we had all these years, still to this day, going back and forth. 
And she didn't tell me until like two or three years ago that she was, I think, raped. She said she was raped when she was a kid. Wow. So just imagine your mom telling you this and you yeah. all this time you going back and forth being rebellious and everything. And she holding this in. So it's like, man, like if if I knew that a long could time ago even, what I had. It, well, how could she even you there's no way she could even talk to you about that, discuss that with you. There's no way you yeah. could have comprehended why. Yeah, it's man, that's gotta be so tough. Sorry to interrupt, man. Go ahead. Man, I think we should end up the, the podcast right there, like uh on, you know, we do have some type of like I like I I got some type of disconnection with my mom, a little resilient uh like Resentment. What's the word? Resentment. Resentment. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we still need to understand that our parents are not superheroes that, right. that we think that they are. They are human. Yeah. They're going through the same things that we're going through. Just imagine you growing up right now. Like you said, all the stuff you went through. Just imagine what they went through. And you have we have to be open to to understand that they're not perfect yeah and we gotta we gotta understand that yeah you know what i mean well yeah and i I completely agree with you you know and i mean on that same note you know unfortunately for me i didn't realize that you know what we just discussed you know how severe you know, the things that my mom was dealing with, the depression, the anxiety, until it was too late for me. I did not realize these things until I started dealing with them extremely myself, but she was already gone. So I didn't have a chance to understand those things until she had already passed. Fortunately for you, your mom is still here. That's a good thing. And you guys do have a chance to get through or work through whatever y'all got going on right now. But at the same time, on that same note, it is important for you to protect your peace, protect your well-being. And if you and your mom are in two different spots and for whatever it is, because, I mean, you've talked to me about this before, you know, you got to – you got to maintain relationships that are positive for you in your life. You know what I mean? And if you feel like that any type of relationship that you have, whether it be family or friends, is having a negative impact on your well-being, your peace, your life, then it's best for you to distance yourself from whoever that is. Now, if that's the way that you feel, I don't know. I can't speak for you, whether, you know, when it comes to your mom and your relationship, but it's 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 very important to understand that no matter what y'all still are going to love each other, no matter what that love between a mother and a child, it can't be, it can't be dissipated. It, it, it won't be broken. Um, but you know, it, the good thing is, is no matter what y'all are going through, you know, if y'all can open up some kind of line of communication between the two of you guys, you know, it, it, and, and hopefully get it to a, some kind of normal yeah, situation yeah. like that. would be good. I think. But that's just me personally. That's what I would do if I had the opportunity. And I, unfortunately, I don't. I got to yeah. talk to the guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you say yeah. to your mom right now that you wish you could have said to her back Man. then? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the stress that I added to, you know, everything that you were already dealing with. Uh, I'm sorry for blaming you for so many things that went wrong in my life and, and letting you know about that blame to your face. I'm sorry for a lot of the things that I said out of anger that I never got the chance to take back and that I love you more than you could ever understand. And I wish you were here to this day. And my biggest, my biggest, biggest regret is the fact that my sons never had the opportunity to meet my mom. Never. 
that was the toughest. That is the toughest thing for me. It's hardest uh, even talking about it because they ask about her all the time, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, my mom wanted nothing more. You know, she got a chance to meet my daughter. She had a very good relationship with my daughter. But she used to tell me all the time, I hope to God that you have a son that looks just like you did when you were my little baby boy. And six months after she died, bro, Nico was born. That's tough. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> well, man. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure she's looking down on you right now. She's pretty proud of the man you become because you yeah. are somebody that I look up to and you are a good role model, for real, like seriously. I think I told you this plenty of times. And I'm pretty sure she's smiling up there, you know, with Jesus. And she's looking yeah. down proud of you, bro. And uh, that's all, man. That's 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 what's up, man. And yeah, Lee. Well, happy birthday. A warm happy birthday to my mom today. She should have been seven years old. Yeah. But on that note, I'm going to need to drop these tears, man. I think it's a good time to end this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ain't know he's going to get that deep, man. <laughs> we got to. But, hey, you know what? That's that's the goal. That's the goal. That's I mean, just like, you know, we were talking before this this podcast is not only to try and reach out, help people that might be dealing with some of these things that we've dealt with and gone through, but it's also sort of a therapy session for us too, to kind of talk out some of these things and unpack <laughs> these things that we ain't, right. we ain't had a chance to do ourselves. So this is raw, man. This is, this is me being genuine. I don't, I, I don't even think I've ever told you about that, about the whole Nico, not me, no. my mom, and, you know? Yeah. Yep, so that's a first. <laughs> well, we're glad that y'all tuned in to this podcast. For and sure. uh, make sure y'all subscribe, comment, like below. We'll be coming back with another podcast very soon. And we'll see y'all then on Beyond the Shadows.